mankind. There is no denying that he is indeed a masterpiece of engineering. Medical science has helped us to appreciate just some of the amazing complexity of the thousands of biochemical, mechanical, and electrical processes found in the human body. In fact, this dynamic, self-replicating, self-repairing system called the human body is unparalleled by any of the marvelous inventions that man himself has created. One such invention, the MRI scanner, has in recent years allowed us to expand even further the depth of our understanding of the structure and function of the human body. Before the advent of the MRI scanner, we could only crudely assess the inner workings of structures, such as the joints, heart, and brain. But now, with the MRI scanner, we can, in a non-invasive manner, observe the integrity of muscles, ligaments, tendons, cartilage, blood flow, the brain, and spinal cord. With the MRI scanner, we are able to push the frontiers of science even to the extent of probing the very thoughts of mankind himself. In 1977, Dr. Raymond Damadian invented the MRI scanner. The recipient of the 2001 Lemelson MIT Achievement Award and the 1988 National Medal of Technology his name stands among some of the greatest inventors in history in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. The date? April 2013. Location? Long Island, New York. Dr. Shem Dharampal, a Canadian radiologist, visits Dr. Damadian at the birthplace of the MRI scanner. Hello, Dr. Damadian. Thank you for this opportunity to interview you. Would you explain to us briefly what an MRI scanner does and how it works? I, th I think the way to understand it, it's using the basic technology that we know as NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. And the way it works is that if you take a sample, it could be a tissue sample, it could be any chemical sample, you first put it inside a magnet. And once you put it inside the magnet, the atoms that are inside the tissue polarize. Uh, they're magnetically polarized. What, what you can do is you'll take a radio signal and you put it into those atoms. And those atoms will answer back with their own radio signal. And it turns out that the radio signal coming back from the atoms are chemically extremely discerning and have enormous capacity to give detail, which we today turn into an image. Uh, when was it that you made your first image with the MRI scanner? In July 3rd, 1977, 4.45 a.m. <laughs> Changed the world. <laughs> I understand that you received the National Medal of Technology for this invention from President Ronald Reagan. Could you tell us what that experience was like? Well, it was naturally exciting, and, and uh, it was there with my, my wife and my children, and um, it was a thrilling moment to have the president tell us we did something worthwhile. In regards to anatomic detail and function, what are we able to see with the MRI scanner? Well, as it turned out, um, because we were able to get very powerful discrimination in the vital soft tissues, we were able to see detail that the uh, medical technology could never see before. And as it turned out also, um, we were able to get a signal from uh, a piece of tissue that was less than a millimeter in size. In fact, I think currently uh, we're able to see as small as a quarter of a millimeter in three directions. When we're getting the signal, we're getting the signal from the water molecule. So we can actually track the water molecule and see the rate at which the water molecule is going in and out of the tumor. Uh, and we call that diffusion-weighted imaging. 
And we, for example, are using that today to detect prostate cancers and distinguish it from other kinds of prostate disease because the diffusion weighted signal is uh, a, a much lower diffusion rate in prostate cancers than it is in normal. Recently, our knowledge of the structure and function of living things has exploded. From the information in DNA to the wiring of the brain, scientific knowledge has caused many to question the validity of evolution. How could such profound order and wisdom come about by accumulated chance occurrences over vast eons of time? Dr. Darren Paul challenged Dr. Damadian to offer his perspective of this pivotal question concerning the origin of life. To argue that life came about entirely by chance, when you know the level of detail of, of, of biochemistry and physiology that uh, us physicians know, that's just an absurdity. I mean, there's no prospect when you look at the details of that, that all of the details of physiology that gives us life today uh, came about by accident. It just doesn't compute. And if you look at it in detail, you see there's no evidence for that. There's no way to look at the sophisticated physiology and anatomy of a living human being and to argue that it came about by statistical chance. And when you look at the evidence uh, that it proceeded from statistical chance, uh, which I've done in detail, it just doesn't compute. Statistically impossible? Let's take a look at the probability of forming just one of the smallest proteins by random chance. We will look at the protein insulin, a protein critical for glucose metabolism. Insulin is made up of 51 amino acids. To manufacture insulin, the cell must first construct a chain of protein 84 amino acids long called proinsulin. Next, it must fold and cross-bond proinsulin into a specific shape. Finally, a section of this protein, 33 amino acids long, is cut out by special enzymes. This leaves 51 amino acids properly oriented in two cross-linked chains, which is the final insulin molecule. In order to determine the probability of forming insulin, we must calculate the probability of forming proinsulin. Given that there are 20 different existing amino acids and that there are 84 amino acids in a proinsulin molecule, we are able to calculate that the total possible arrangement is 20 to the 84th. Converting this to base 10, it is approximately 10 to the 109th. That is one in one with 109 zeros after it. To bring this number into perspective, the total number of atoms in the universe is estimated at 10 to the 82nd atoms, which is much less than 10 to the 109th. Simply stated, it would be more likely for a blindfolded person to find one specific atom in the universe than for a proinsulin molecule to form out of all the 84 amino acid protein combinations that are possible. When using more realistic parameters, including the number of proteins that need to be formed, the DNA coding of these proteins and the time factor in which this is to occur the odds against life forming by chance become even more unimaginable and is deemed statistically impossible. So what do you observe when you examine a patient with the MRI scanner? According to evolution, changes in the genetic code accumulate to make things better, smarter, better able to survive, stronger. But medical science has shown us that these changes result in disease. Decidedly so. And it's exactly what the Bible teaches us, you know, as the consequence of the curse was that everything was be running downhill. And prior to the curse, man was to live indefinitely. If we look at the natural laws of science, uh, what happens to materials as you sit and observe them? And they don't progressively uh, make themselves more specific and more detailed. In a simple uh, example is if you leave your car, it doesn't turn into a Cadillac. It turns into a, a deteriorated lump of rust. Uh, and that is really w what, what basically all of our fundamental laws of science are saying. So that, what I just described was the second law of thermodynamics, which simply says that as you observe systems, they're continually running down until the point that all the molecules are essentially in equilibrium. You have no discriminating uh, specification. Of, of any of them. You can't get there by chance, is the long and short of it. The fundamental question that you have to ask is, where did life come from? Did life come from nothing? Uh, if you look at all the theories, and including the theory of evolution, every one of them starts with something. 
uh, the evolutionary theory, the evolution start with the slime mold. The slime mold turns into a human being. But if you accept the reality that the physical world, under the present laws of physics, are continually deteriorating to ultimate equilibrium and, and, and destruction, such as this first and second law of thermodynamics say. The first law of thermodynamics says, for example, nothing is now being created nor destroyed. And if, all, if everything is uh, under the process of deterioration, then ultimate, ultimately everything dies. And, and in other words, what we see, uh, apprehend in the material world, is gradually degenerating. And, and coming to death. Now that forces the conclusion that there had to be a beginning. And if if there was a beginning, then the beginning um, was nothing. And somehow you have to get from nothing to something. Uh, and you can't get there by any of the physical laws that we know. There's only one way to get from nothing to something, and that's what the book of Genesis tells us exactly how it does. And it's the only document that we have that addresses how you get from nothing to something. All of the other philosophical ideologies all start with something. Now, you want to insist that you know how creation came about without the existence of our maker, um, you have to explain how to violate all the laws of physics and go from nothing to something by chance. The National Geographic website states, The most popular theory of our universe's origin centers on a cosmic cataclysm unmatched in all of history, the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, scientists believe the entire vastness of the observable universe, including all of its matter and radiation, was compressed into a hot, dense mass just a few millimeters across. This nearly incomprehensible state is theorized to have existed for just a fraction of the first second of time. Big Bang proponents suggest that some 10 billion to 20 billion years ago, a massive blast allowed all the universe's known matter and energy, even space and time themselves, to spring from some ancient and unknown type of energy. The Big Bang theory leaves several major questions unanswered. One is the original cause of the Big Bang itself. Several answers have been proposed to address this fundamental question, but none has been proven, and even adequately testing them has proven to be a formidable challenge. So we have our answer to the beginning of the universe, or do we? Notice that the origin of the matter mass that exploded and expanded remains unknown. Notice too that the origin of the energy necessary for all of this to occur also remains unknown. Scientists are still without an answer. Do you believe that there's any scientific evidence at all supporting the, the belief of evolution? No, you know, from my perspective, it's science fiction. Evolution is science fiction? Scientists often claim that evolution is science, yet here is Oxford professor Richard Dawkins imagining that aliens seeded life on How Earth. How did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, no. no, no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this this planet um, now th that is a possibility and a, and a intriguing possibility mm -hmm. and i suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the um at the detail details of biochemistry molecular biology you might find a signature of some sort of designer wait a second Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design just certain types of designers, such as God. Men have no excuse for denying the creation, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. 
For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, New Testament. Part of the essential criteria for a theory to stand as such is that it must be consistent with pre-existing experimental results. At the least, it should not contradict any established laws of science. Dr. Demadian is questioned on this as it pertains to the theory of evolution. Does the doctrine of evolution contradict any known facts of science? Definitely so. It's very important and interesting in this uh, context to compare what the scripture teaches us, what the word teaches us, with what evolution would like to claim. And so what you have as the dialogue is, is continuing today is that um, people who are materialistically oriented would say that this is a dialogue of religion versus science. Creation being religion and evolution being science. I would rephrase that. This Today it's a dialogue between true science and science fiction. Uh, evolution being the science fiction. Now, what do I mean by that? What the Bible presents is a very clear definitive that each is descended from its own kind. Now, evolution would try to argue that presented initially by some accident, we had the development of the slime mold, and the slime mold successively evolved into something like a human being. In order to substantiate such a claim, you have to be able to make a transition from one kind to another kind. You have to be able to go from a chimpanzee to a human being. You have to be able to go from a lizard to a chimpanzee. And to justify such a claim, you have to have evidence. Right. Well, one of the self-evident things is that we know, for example, that the chimpanzee and uh, all of the primate brains are 400 cc's. And we know the human brain is 1200 cc's. So if you want to make the claim that you are proceeding from an ape to a human being and that it is coming about by systematic perfection, which violates all the laws of physics, you have to be able to show some evidence that an ape is transforming from a 400 cc brain to a 1200 cc brain. And the evidence is non-existent. There, there, there's, there's no evidence um, of these transformations going from one kind to another, and, and all the evidence is completely consistent with each after its own kind. Virtually all of the proposed missing links between apes and humans have been soundly discredited from the outright fabrications to those that were the object of wishful thinking. In almost all cases, fossil fragments are discovered and heralded as missing links with the artist's conception presented in the press, museums, textbooks, and journal articles with great artistic license taken. For example, in 1922, Harold Cook found one tooth in Nebraska and declared it to be a missing link, dubbed Nebraska Man. The Illustrated London News published the artist's conception of an entire ape-like man and his wife just from the tooth. It was subsequently discovered to be the tooth of an extinct pig. In 1856, fossils found in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf, Germany, were presented as a 30,000-year-old ancestor of modern humans. In 1909, a relatively complete skeleton of a Neanderthal was found in La chapelle en France. Artist conceptions were published that showed Neanderthal man as a very ape-like creature. Since that time, it has been found that culturally, the Neanderthals were exactly the same as modern humans, burying their dead with flowers, painting, making and using musical instruments, using language, poetry, etc. Moreover, the brain capacity of their skull vault was found to be on average 1,600 cubic centimeters, which is 200 cubic centimeters larger than most human brain capacities. A longtime science writer, Boyce Rosenberger, explains it this way in Science Digest in 1981. Unfortunately, the vast majority of artists' conceptions are based more on imagination than on evidence. But a handful of expert natural history artists begin with the fossil bones of a hominid and work from there. Much of the reconstruction, however, is guesswork. Bones say nothing about the fleshy parts of the nose, lips, or ears. Artists must create something between an ape and a human being. The older the specimen is said to be, the more ape-like they make it. Hairiness is a matter of pure conjecture. The guesswork approach often leads to errors. One of the major arguments used in defense of the evolutionary timeline is carbon-14 dating. However, Dr. Demadian points out the inaccuracies of this method. The radioactive dating is reliable for short periods of time, you know, 500 years, 1,000 years. 
uh, maybe 2,000 years. And when you try to use that radioactive dating of radioactive isotopes as it's producing this decay and arguing that that's going to give you a reliable estimation going back 100 million years or 500 million years, it's completely unwarranted. When, when I take a sample that's got carbon-14 in it, in order to be able to trust that radioactive dating, I have to isolate that sample and certify that nothing's coming into the sample or nothing's coming out of the sample that can remove that radioactive tracer and create the impression that it's much older than it is. Nobody's provided evidence like that. If I have a sample that's going to be washed by water, I'm going to wash carbon-14 out of there. That's, that's not complicated. And nobody's provided substantive evidence that they have a sample with carbon-14 dating that remain completely uninfluenced and isolated for half a million years. The, 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 the radioactive dating is just not a reliable argument uh, for millions of years creation. It just isn't. When I was lost in the grip of what I call the bondage of secular materialism and secular atheism, and I said at one time to a tech that I had that there is no God. And my tech turned around and said to me, I can't believe you just said that. And I said, well, that's what I believe. Um, and then, subsequent to that, learned that I was dead wrong and accepted Christ and salvation passionately thereafter. But it, it took a lot of understanding. See, the, the, the problem is that when you're a scientist and you've undergone the kind of extensive education that you're undergoing, in the process without you even knowing, you are being programmed into the sacredness of materialism and evolution. What's really happening is you're being put in chains and don't know what's happening. And the only way you escape those chains is to examine what is the evidence for this accidental process of evolution. And when you look at it in detail, you discover that there is no evidence. It's science fiction from start to finish. Now, I think that the important thing to understand is that <clears throat> when Darwin was setting about to do it, what Darwin was doing, he was getting encouragement from Nietzsche, the God is dead Nietzsche, and he was getting encouragement from Wellhausen. And uh, they both were taking philosophical positions that there was no God, and that materialism was the rule. It's the same, by the way, materialism and the evolutionary survival of the fittest. It gave us uh, Adolf Hitler and all, all the, the evil and wickedness they're in. So we're, we're being continually programmed into this philosophy this false philosophy, what I call the science fiction, of evolution. But when you look at it very carefully about what did Darwin do and what did Darwin not do, what you see very clearly is what Darwin showed as within the bird species, there were variations from one bird type to another type. But Darwin showed us no way to get from one kind to another kind, which is what Genesis teaches us. Genesis teaches us each after its own kind. It doesn't say anything about variation within the kind. It simply says you can't go from one kind to another kind without the Creator. And Darwin never got past that. Darwin was exclusively committing to variation within the kind. And he provides no explanation from getting from nothing to something or no explanation to get from a slime mold to a human being. Which, I like to say this, but it's just plain preposterous. Does scientific progress depend upon evolutionary presuppositions? No, I think it's reverse. I mean, I, I think the evolutionary concept is contrary to science, and the creationists are the ones who are amassing all the true evidence of science. One cannot be exposed to the law and order of the universe without concluding that there must be a divine intent behind it all. The Creator is revealed through His creation. NASA Director Warner Von Braun 
All human discoveries seem to be made only for the purpose of confirming more and more strongly the truths come from on high and contained in the sacred writings. Astronomer and discoverer of Uranus, Sir John Herschel. The nearer I approach to the end of my pilgrimage, the clearer is the evidence of the divine origin of the Bible. The grandeur and sublimity of God's remedy for fallen man are more appreciated, and the future is illumined with hope and joy. Samuel Morse. The Bible and it alone, with nothing added to it nor taken away from it by man, is the sole and sufficient guide for each individual, at all times and in all circumstances. Electricity and Magnetism, Michael Faraday. It, it compels me to comment um, from the quotation of Colossians 2.3. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so many of these developments in, in, in science and especially in creation um, lead you to questions about, you know, where did the creation come from? I sometimes get asked, where'd you get this idea of the MRI? And I think the right answer, and the most important answer, is in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. To sum this all up, what does the evidence lead you to believe? If, if you read the data, now I'm talking about the evidence, if you read the evidence, you can't come to any other conclusion but that Jesus is exactly who he said he was, and that the creation took place exactly the way the creation is detailed in the book of Genesis. You sit and read the Bible from start to finish, you can't, I don't think you can come to any other conclusion but that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. What exactly did Jesus say about himself? To find the answer to this, we must go to the Holy Bible. Jesus tells us in the Holy Scriptures that He is the promised Messiah of the Jews, sinless, the only way to God, eternally pre-existing, one with God the Father, able to forgive sins, the heavenly King, able to give everlasting life, that He would die and come back to life, that He would return and judge the world. God created the world perfect, but man brought sin into the world, resulting in death and suffering. Evolution is a lie created by the devil to deceive mankind into thinking that there is no consequence for sin. But the Bible tells us that the penalty for sin is death, not just physical death, but also eternal separation from God in a place of eternal torment called the lake of fire. Everyone has broken God's laws, thereby sinning against God and thereby justly condemned to hell because of our sins. But there is good news. The Bible tells us that God loves us and has provided a way for our sins to be forgiven. It is through a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. You see, the Bible tells us that God came to live amongst us as a man named Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And then he took our penalty for sin upon himself, Romans 5.8. He died for our sins. He was buried and then resurrected on the third day, 1 Corinthians 3-8. through The Bible calls this the gospel, which means good news. Friend, are you tired of your sins? Do you want to be cleansed of your sins and be reconciled to God? Jesus Christ said that we must repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1.15 and except we repent, we will perish, Luke 13, 3. Repentance is not penance or self-reformation of one's life, but is a change in our hearts and minds that involves an acknowledgement of our wicked sinful condition, guilt and regret over sin, and a turning from our sins to God for mercy, forgiveness, and help. Would you repent today? Come to Jesus even now, believing the gospel that Jesus died for your sins and rose again. Trust Him to save you from your sins. Reject any other way of being saved from your sins. Trust only in Jesus, not Jesus plus your good works, not Jesus plus your baptism, not Jesus plus religion. Just trust Jesus Christ alone. The Bible tells us that at the very moment we repent of our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes and dwells in us and makes us a child of God and gives us eternal life. This is called being born again of the Spirit of God. And Jesus said that except we are born again, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John 3 verses 3 and 5.